Hello, my name is Zhel Kozidric. Welcome to this lecture on negative campaigning in political election campaigns. This lecture is part of a series developed by the Civic Innovation Incubator. Advice for conservative activists. If you want to hold someone accountable, you need to be critical. Before you can start giving solutions to change the status quo, you have to be able to explain what is wrong at present. You can't just say what you want to do and expect people to support you. Negative advertising, while people say they do not like it, is actually quite an effective tool. Surprisingly, some experts say that comparative advertising actually makes voters more informed and motivated for action and thereby helps democracy. So, we do need to have an effective negative campaign component in our overall campaign strategy, and we need to know how to defend ourselves when attacked. In this video, our objective is to understand the process of negative campaigning. The video is divided into five parts. In the first part, the introduction, we will explain what negative campaigning is. In the second part, we'll look at what negative campaigning tries to accomplish. In the third part, we'll explain how negative campaigning affects the brain. In the fourth, this is your offense plan. And in the fifth, we will talk about your defense plan. Tired of the name calling? Smear campaigns? Mudslinging? Are you disgusted with the state of Canadian politics? This does not represent our Canada. It doesn't have to be like this. It's time to send a message and change the channel on attack politics. The Green Party of Canada. It's time. We know that voters want good things to happen, but they also want to avoid something bad from happening. They want to avoid someone innately corrupt or out of touch with voter needs from coming to power. The objective of election campaign advertising is to give voters the information they need to have in order to make an informed decision. If all we had were traditional positive campaigns, then we would have only positive biased information, and that's not good enough. But political ads, especially negative ads, have a bad reputation. But it has been found that ads that draw contrasts between a candidate and the opponent's positions on issues or past record are important to overcome the positive bias of traditional advertising. The Daisy ad, which you will see shortly, was a turning point in political and advertising history. The incumbent Lyndon Johnson aired the ad only once in 1964, portraying how dangerous Barry Goldwater would be for America. The fear created, in part by this ad, was one of the factors in Johnson's landslide victory over Goldwater. children can live are to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Contrary to popular belief, campaigns aren't all negative, but they're getting there. It's up to you as the campaign manager to determine how negative you want to go. In the U.S., negative campaigning is slinging more mud than ever before, with parties spending close to 70% of their advertising budget on negative campaigning. The Westland Media Project compiled this chart to show how political advertising has become distinctly more negative over the past few American presidential election cycles. While campaigns might not be this extreme in other countries, be aware of this trend because it might come to you. There needs to be balance. William Benoit found that in television spots from 1952 to 2004, candidates averaged about 40% attacks in their ad statements. Presidential ads discussed policy in 62% of their statements and character in 38. 
In 2008, the statements in Obama's ads were about 68% negative, compared to 62 for John McCain. Obama's historic 30-minute infomercial was more positive than the campaign, with only 18% attacks. And it never mentioned McCain or President Bush by name. The only time Bush was mentioned in the infomercial was once when Obama alluded to eight years of failed policies. Obama discussed 55% policy and 45% character. The primary goal in advertising, we feel instinctively, should be positive. Positive ads are the ones that promote you, your character, your capabilities. Positive ads show why you are better. The negative ad is the one that talks about your opponent, with the objective being to show that your opponent is unqualified and untrustworthy, that they are not as good as you. The positive ad will show the benefits of your program creating optimism and expectations. The negative ad will show the risks and costs associated with your opponent and their program. In your positive campaign, you will try to paint the best possible picture for the benefits of your policy priorities. In the same way, your opponent will try to do the same. Your opponent will not tell the whole truth. Your opponent will try to spin things to make his policies look best. The voters do not have the time, resources, or capability to evaluate the truth of your opponent's claims. So it is up to you. The objective of your negative campaign is to tell the voters the parts of the story that your opponent is not telling. You are, in fact, doing the voters a service by informing them so that they can make a better decision. Negative ads can be divided into two types, comparative ads and attack ads. What most people are opposed to are the attack ads. These focus solely on the opponent. There is no compare and contrast. These attack ads many times stray away from ideology, policy, or capability and turn into personal attacks, especially in lower-level elections. They are called attack ads because of the style of the negative advertising that creates a sense of stress and urgency. To get your attention, the announcer screams at you, yelling his points to make sure that you're listening. Explaining those same points in a calm presentation would be boring and less effective, at least that seems to be the prevailing theory. The objective of comparative ads is to talk about both you and your opponent and to compare and contrast the relative merits and risks of your opponent's policies and abilities against yours and showing why you are the better choice. If you position your comparative campaign against your opponent in opposition to where you are strongest, then these ads will also add to your narrative promoting your story while being critical of your opponent. Remember, always position your communications to be telling your story. In these comparative ads, not only do we learn more about the important issues of the day, we also learn about the characteristics of the candidates. What sort of characters do they have? How they go on offense shows what sort of respect they have for others. How they react on defense shows strength and intelligence. We want leaders to be strong, but we also want them to be decent. The attacker can suffer significant backlash if they attack the opponent with personal sleaze, baseless mudslinging, and misinformation. When crafting your negative campaign, think about how it will add to your brand story and affect your brand equity. If people see your negative ads as warnings and protecting them, then they will see that as a good thing and you will be a good guy. If your ads are just personal attacks and smear campaigns, then you will be seen as a bad guy. In business, we have a concept called FUD. This is a tactic used in sales, marketing, and public relations, which is generally a strategic attempt to influence perception by disseminating negative, and dubious or even sometimes false information. FUD was first defined with its specific current meaning by Gene Omdahl in 1975. After he left IBM to found his own company, he said that FUD is the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that IBM salespeople instill in the minds of potential customers who might be considering Omdahl products. Shockvertising, the use of fear in commercial ad campaigns, has become increasingly popular in recent years. From car commercials that imply having fewer airbags will cause your family harm, to disinfectant commercials that show bacteria lurking on every surface, fear-based advertising works. 
Fear is a strong emotion because it puts us into protection mode, but it can also be manipulated to steer people into making emotional rather than reasoned choices. For an interesting example of negative commercial advertising, view on YouTube the Chipotle ad named The Scarecrow. The ad goes negative against the whole industry and differentiates Chipotle from everyone else as being the only natural option. Unfortunately, copyright issues do not allow me to embed the video here, but please do go take a look at the video. It is quite good. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt morph into fear, anger, and disgust in politics. Fear and anger are two of the most powerful emotions and motivators. The emotion of disgust is one of the easiest to elicit, but when related to politics, because it is values-based, it is very subjective and one of the most dangerous to try to elicit. So far, only pedophilia is something that is nearly universally disgusting, and the progressives are trying to make even that acceptable. Like I said, not all negative ads are bad. They are tools, and what makes them good or bad is how you use them. You can categorize negative ads into ones that discuss the person or policy, those that address the past and those that address the future. The best strategy is to discuss the effects your opponent's policies will have in the future. We are, after all, voting for the direction of the government over the next four or five years, but based on a foundation of past policy effects. In 2012, Mitt Romney tried to show how Obama was planning to change welfare reform. Take a look at his commercial. In 1996, President Clinton and a bipartisan Congress helped end welfare as we know it by requiring work for welfare. But on July 12th, President Obama quietly announced a plan to gut welfare reform by dropping work requirements. Under Obama's plan, you wouldn't have to work and wouldn't have to train for a job. They just send you your welfare check. And welfare to work goes back to being plain old welfare. Mitt Romney will restore the work requirement because it works. I'm Mitt Romney and I approve this message. The media loves it when a politician screws up. The Obama campaign responded quite effectively against Romney's welfare ad. So, make sure that you have your facts straight. You don't want to end up looking this foolish. Let's talk about what it takes to get America working again. President Obama quietly announced a plan to gut welfare reform. PolitiFact gives us the rating of pants on fire, which means really, really false. You wouldn't have to work, you wouldn't have to train for a job, they just send you a welfare check. That is not factually correct. Ron Haskins, a former Republican congressional staffer who helped draft welfare reform, says Romney is wrong about the waivers. Is there any truth to the charge that we're getting rid of work as a requirement for welfare payments? No, there is absolutely no truth to it. It's another misleading ad about the president's position on welfare That's reform. Right. What does Bill Clinton think of this latest line of Romney attack? Well, I think he thinks it's unplugged from reality. We're in a kind of silly season of negative ads, uh, but this one has no basis in, in, in fact. Even though his ad accusing the president of weakening work requirements for welfare recipients got a pants on fire from PolitiFact and four Pinocchios from the Washington Post, Mitt Romney is doubling down on the claim. The ad itself is full of outright lies. The notion that the work requirement has never ended is a lie. Mr. President, take your campaign out of the gutter. Another good strategy is to look at the failures of past policies. Did your opponent fulfill the promises that were made? Did the policies achieve what was promised? In this next commercial, Obama showed America how Romney performed in Massachusetts as governor. Romney's past actions were used to predict what will happen to the USA if Romney is elected president. I'm Barack Obama and I approve this message. It started like this. I speak the language of business. I know how jobs are created. But it ended like this. One of the worst economic records in the country. When Mitt Romney was governor, Massachusetts lost 40,000 manufacturing jobs, a rate twice the national average, and fell to 47th in job creation, fourth from the bottom. Instead of hiring workers from his own state, Romney outsourced call center jobs to India. 
He cut taxes for millionaires like himself while raising them on the middle class and left the state 2.6 billion deeper in debt. So now, when Mitt Romney talks about what he'd do as president, I know what it takes to create jobs. Remember, we've heard it all before. I know how jobs are created. Romney Economics. It didn't work then, and it won't work now. Of course you will spin the facts to best tell your story in an attention-grabbing way, but do tell the truth. Showing how character will affect future performance can be a good strategy. A discussion about character is warranted if past experiences can be used as indicators of future performance in office. It is possible to show that the opponent does not have the capability to fulfill promises. You can bring into question who the opponent is allied to, the voters or lobbyists. If in the first term lobbyists took priority, then they will take priority in the second term as well. In the following ad, Obama claimed that Romney's health care policies at one of his companies caused the woman to die of cancer, insinuating that Romney would do the same for the national health care plan. I don't think Mitt Romney understands what he's done to people's lives by closing the plan. I don't think he realizes that, that people's lives completely changed. When Mitt Romney and Bain closed the plan, I lost my health care. And my family lost their health care. And uh, uh, a short time after that, my wife became ill. I don't know how long she was sick. Uh, and I think maybe she didn't say anything because she knew that we, we couldn't afford the insurance. And, and then one day she, she uh, became ill and, and I took her up to the Jackson County Hospital and, and, and admitted her for pneumonia. And that's when they found the cancer. And by then it was stage four. It was, it was, there was nothing they could do for her and she passed away in 22 days. I do not think Mitt Romney realizes what he's done to anyone. And I, furthermore, I do not think Mitt Romney is concerned. Priorities USA Action is responsible for the content of this advertising. Is this a fair attack? How can you claim something like this? If I recall, Obama said that it was a super PAC that created the ad and not his campaign team. That might be the case, but remember, this still affects his brand. Everyone in your political ecosystem should tell the truth. What does it say about a president's character when his campaign tries to use the tragedy of a woman's death for political gain? What does it say about a president's character when he had his campaign raise money for the ad, then stood by as his top aides were caught lying about it? Doesn't America deserve better than a president who will say or do anything to stay in power? I'm Mitt Romney, and I approved this message. What you want to avoid are personal attacks based on the candidate's life, especially minor issues. Everyone's made mistakes in life. These might actually backfire on you, showing you as being petty and a dirty player. Remember, those that live in glass houses should not throw stones. In the next ad, Obama made an attack on Romney that looks like it's about previous policies, but it is actually about a personal characteristic, Romney's bad singing. Why else would the singing be so prominent? Is this fair? At least Romney tried to sing that difficult song. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of gray. For purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with bright. For a guy promoting hope and change, Obama was quite nasty at times. If you're going to go negative, or better yet, to say when you decide to go negative, do it with integrity. Never attack someone's disabilities or gender or religion or anything personal. How stupid personal attacks can get is shown in a progressive conservative ad in Canada from 1993 where the conservatives attacked the liberal leader for a facial deformity. Is this a prime minister? The ads show unflattering still pictures of liberal leader Jean Chrétien, all close-ups. How can he believe that you can kickstart a modern economy by fixing some roads? The ads are completely negative. 
One suggests Chrétien would be a national embarrassment as prime minister. There is no mention of the conservatives' leader or conservative policies. Jean Chrétien, a prime minister? Think twice. But last night, the conservative party reached a new low. Liberals are calling the ads a sign of political desperation. They try to make fun of the way I look. God gave me a physical defect. And I've accepted that since I'm a kid. It's true that I speak on one side of my mouth. I'm not a Tory, I don't speak on both sides of my mouth. The Conservatives suffered a historic loss in 1993, winning only two seats in Parliament. Eleanor Roosevelt said, Great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people. Do not use personal attacks. Ad hominem debate strategies where you try to discredit the argument by discrediting the person are bad. Discredit the argument and you will win the debate. Win the debate by discussing ideas. That way, you will win the election. Now let's take a look at the high-level objectives of an election negative campaign. To win the election, our goal is to get more votes than our opponents. We do not have to get 50% plus one of all citizens to vote for us, just a majority of actual votes. This can be accomplished by having more of our supporters voting and fewer competition supporters participating. As a starting point, we know that roughly 30% of the people have already decided who they will vote for, and they will not change their minds. They are loyal and committed, but we don't know how many will vote. 40% of citizens will definitely not vote, and 10% might not vote. 20% will probably vote, but are undecided. These are known as the persuadable. We might be able to persuade them to vote for us. I will use the American two-party system as the primary example due to its simplicity. The big picture objective of the negative campaign is to increase the participation level of your supporters and decrease your opponent's supporters' desire to vote. But while you are trying to suppress your opponent's voters, your opponent is also trying to suppress yours. Negative advertising bombardment causes fewer undecided independent voters to participate and the result is lower voter turnout. Both parties want lower turnout from the undecided because it decreases complexity and risk of losing. Some campaign managers are of the opinion that a mobilization strategy, a get-out-to-vote campaign for their own base, is preferable to a persuasion campaign aimed at the undecided because persuasion takes a lot of time and effort. Campaign managers do not like the undecided and therefore want to minimize their participation. Running a negative campaign strategy in Canada is more complicated as there is a three-party system at the national level. The undecided are not split in between two parties, but spread out between three major parties, four parties when you look at the province of Quebec. If you are a conservative and you create fear hoping that an undecided voter leaning to the Liberals would consider to support you, you can't be guaranteed that they will come to you as they have another option on the left the NDP. In Europe and South America, where there are sometimes four or more major parties, who do you attack? A negative strategy gets very complicated. Attacking three opponents can use up a lot of time and resources, but there are interesting opportunities for coordinated negative attacks, especially if you consider the scenario where you have a number of small conservative challenger parties attacking a large socialist incumbent. Now let's take a quick look at the voters. There are two types of voters, the aligned, also known as the registered or loyal, and the unaligned, also known as the independent or undecided. The aligned voters vote by habit for the party that they are loyal to. They tow the party line. They are usually single or few issue voters. The main goal for the campaign manager is to mobilize these people to vote through the GOTV campaign. The unaligned voters are more often cross-pressured voters that do not see the world in a polarized manner. They are concerned about balanced budgets and waiting lists at the hospitals. They want to hear a balanced argument. They don't want someone to just focus on one issue or the other. Winning their support is difficult, especially when you are trying to talk to your base in one way and to your opponent's base in another way. 
Successful suppression of the independent voters shifts campaign priorities from persuasion to mobilization. When voter turnout is high and the number of unaligned independent voters is high, campaigns concentrate on wooing independent voters. But as the turnout gets lower, the people who show up to vote tend to be the ones who aren't cross-pressured. These are the people that have very consistent points of views, very ideological positions. A vicious circle develops. As fewer people turn out, it causes campaigns to become more extreme, and as campaigns become more extreme, fewer people turn out. A relatively small number of independent voters in key swing states decide the outcome of the U.S. presidential election. By some estimates, there are about 800,000 truly undecided independent voters in the battleground states. Factor in a total of a billion dollars in ads, and that means that campaigns are spending about $1,000 per persuadable voter. I personally do not agree with voter suppression because I see it as a manipulative strategy to prevent people from exercising their democratic rights and obligations. I see elections turning into gamesmanship, that is, gaming the system, abusing the rules and procedures meant to protect a system in order instead to manipulate the system for a desired outcome. But this is done and we have to be aware of it. But once again, to reiterate, negative campaigns are not in themselves bad. They are needed. It is how the negative strategies are used and for what purpose that determines good or bad. The next negative ad is all bad. It does not only speak negatively of the opponent, but it also insinuates that Washington is bad. This ad is bad for everyone's brand. It all started out so good. When Colin Peterson first ran for Congress, he talked about the important issues. But as time passed, Washington changed Congressman Peterson. He started voting with the Liberals in Congress and taking more and more special interest money. And just last year, he even started defending Nancy Pelosi and Obamacare. Collins had a long run, but after 22 years, it's time for him to move on. I am Lee Byberg, and I approve this message. Now we'll take a look at the psychological phenomenon that negative campaigning takes advantage of to accomplish its objectives. Negative campaigns are founded on the principle of negative bias, which is inherent in all people. We weigh negative information more heavily than positive information. We have this bias because mistaking a threat as a non-threat can be much more costly than the reverse, and hence we are hypervigilant to the negatives. Early humans who failed to find lunch went hungry, but those who failed to avoid a lion became lunch. Because our human ancestors benefited greatly from cooperation, humans became sensitive to negative information about violations of group expectations. We are interested in negative political information because we pay a cost as citizens if leaders of our group take advantage of us by mismanaging, misappropriating, or stealing our group resources. In economics and decision theory, loss aversion refers to people's tendency to strongly prefer avoiding losses to acquiring gains. Some studies suggest that losses are twice as powerful, psychologically, as gains. Loss aversion leads to risk aversion. But there is also an optimism bias, which may well be the most significant of the cognitive biases. Optimism protects us from loss and risk aversion. This bias generates the illusion of control, that we have substantial control over our lives and that something positive will happen. Pain is a great short-term motivator, but only pleasure will motivate us in the long term. If you want to learn a little bit more about cognitive biases that work against rational decision-making in all aspects of life, including voting, investigate further the following 10 biases. While in prehistoric times, people had to be attuned to every signal, today we are not being hunted by predators that want to eat us, we are being hunted by companies that want to sell to us. In this age of advertising bombardment via every channel, we've developed a defense mechanism of tuning out in order to ignore the noise of advertising. We also do not believe all the hype that we hear because we know that it is exactly that, hype and reality rarely lives up to the hype. 
But there are messages that break through the defense mechanisms we have developed. Humor breaks through by entertaining us in a non-threatening way, while fear and anger are survival instincts that we just can't ignore. We humans like to believe that we are rational beings making decisions based on reason and careful analysis of cost and expected utility. For the longest time, economists thought this way. But more and more, we are learning that we are beings of irrational, emotional decision-making. Research findings confirm that our decisions are driven more by our emotions than by logical and conscious thinking. Advertisers and artists have known this for a long time. We have both primary and secondary emotions. Primary emotions are those that we feel first, as a first response to a situation. If something good happens to us, we feel joy. When we hear of a death, we feel sadness. These are unthinking, instinctive responses. Secondary emotions are felt next, appearing after primary emotions. They may be caused directly by them, for example, where the fear of a threat turns to anger that fuels the body for a fight reaction, or they may also come from more complex chains of thinking. Fear, anger, and disgust are powerful emotions. Fear and anger are the ones that we are most interested in. When you sense a threat, your mind generates fear and anger. The fear you generate is part of a physiological flight response. Anger is the emotional energy you generate for the fight response. Disgust is an avoidance mechanism. Fear, the flight response, may occur in response to a specific stimulus happening in the present or to a future situation which is perceived as risk to health or life, status, power, security, or anything that we find valuable. It is part of our biological legacy that increases our alertness so that we can make rapid decisions when a new threat appears. One of the consequences of this alert state is that we tend to break the world into absolutes, black or white, right or wrong, good or bad. In political situations, we are less attuned to nuanced information about a person's moral character or the details of a policy proposal. We also fall back on our herd mentality with a tendency to uncritically align with people we consider to be like us, and to distance ourselves from those we consider the others. Anger is an emotional fight response related to one's psychological interpretation of having been threatened. Often when one's basic boundaries are violated or from built-up frustration of not eliminating the threat. Anger is a force of energy that we project in order to push away or combat a threat. Anger can mobilize psychological resources and boost determination toward correction of wrong behaviors, promotion of social justice, and redress of grievances. Interestingly, angry people are more optimistic than people that aren't. Go figure. Maybe it's related to the ability to control and resolve our problems. Anger is often a respected response. We often interpret anger as standing up for ourselves and not letting others take advantage of us. Our anger may be labeled as assertive, strong, and confident. In politics, people grant more status to politicians and to colleagues who express anger than to those who express sadness or guilt. Disgust is a feeling of revulsion towards something unhealthy or offensive. We feel like we've been poisoned. Disgust is believed to have evolved as a component of a behavioral immune system in which the body attempts to avoid disease-carrying pathogens as opposed to having to fight them off after they have entered the body. An interesting aspect of disgust is that when a disgusting thing touches a clean thing, the clean becomes disgusting, but the disgusting does not become clean. In this way, anything associated with something disgusting is disgusting by association. Disgust can also be a powerful social force relating to cleanliness, taboos, and values. We can feel disgust towards a person that has transgressed our rules, in particular our values. We distance ourselves from the object of our disgust. But what might be socially disgusting to one person might not be disgusting to somebody else. And for that reason, in the political space, it is a very difficult emotion to work with. People have varying levels of disgust sensitivity. Some people are more sensitive to disgust than others. 
Those with a higher disgust sensitivity tend to find their own in-group more attractive and tend to have more negative attitudes towards other groups. Here's an interesting bit of information. In some studies, it's been found that people that are more easily disgusted are politically more conservative, while those that are harder to disgust are more progressive. The following three attack ads were run by the incumbent Conservative Party of Canada against the new leader of the Liberal opposition. What do you think their objective is? How do these ads make you feel? Do they accomplish anything? The budget will balance itself. How can someone who thinks budgets balance themselves be trusted with jobs and the economy? Justin Trudeau. He's in way over his head. There is no question that this happened because there is someone who feels completely excluded. How can you make excuses for terrorists and keep Canadians safe? Justin Trudeau, he's in way over his head. I'm actually not in favor of decriminalizing cannabis. I'm in favor of legalizing yeah. it. Imagine selling marijuana just like cigarettes and alcohol. Justin Trudeau, he's in way over his head. The base of all these emotions is our brain, which processes information both consciously and non-consciously. Fear and anger-based attack ads attack the subconscious. Fear hits the part of the brain that handles survival, the reptilian brain. Anger hits the part of the brain that handles emotion, the amygdala. People do not even realize what is happening to their perceptions. If we combine the subconscious parts of the brain, the reptilian and limbic systems into one system, and the conscious parts into another, we develop a model of dual processing in the brain. Dual processing theories are any of a number of theories of social information processing that emerged in the 1980s and the 90s to explain social attitudes, stereotypes, person perception, memory, and decision making. According to these theories, two qualitatively different mechanisms of information processing operate in forming judgments, solving problems, and making decisions. The first being a quick and easy processing mode based on effort-conserving heuristics, and the second being a slow and more difficult rule-based processing mode based on effort-consuming systematic reasoning. The foundations of dual process theory likely come from William James in 1890. He believed that there are two different kinds of thinking, associative and true reasoning. In 1986, Richard Petty and John Cacioppo divided thinking into central and peripheral roots. Central requires active thinking where motivation and ability are high, while the peripheral route is taken when careful thought is not required and shortcuts can be used. In 1996, Stephen Sloman said that stimuli are categorized and processed differently based on the regularity of the events. Stimuli that happen regularly get processed in an associative manner based on past experiences with less thinking, while less frequent or novel stimuli get processed individually. Keith Stanovich and Richard West coined the concept of a two-system thinking in 2000, giving the system's generic names System 1 and System 2. 2004, Fritz Strack and Roland Deutsch said that there are two separate systems, the reflective and the impulsive system. Daniel Kahneman, winner of the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2002, popularized the dual process theories in his 2011 book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Thinking fast is system one. It's subconscious and intuitive. It's emotional, associative, metaphorical, automatic, impressionistic, and it can't be switched off. System 1 thinking reduces our cognitive load by reducing the amount of information we need to process. Its operations involve no sense of intentional control, but it's the secret author of many of the choices and judgments that we make. Slow thinking is System 2. It is conscious and reasoning. It is more deliberative and logical. Its operations require attention and effort. System 2 takes over, rather unwillingly, when things get difficult. System 2 is slothful, 
and tires easily, so it usually accepts what System 1 tells it. System 1 is, for the most part, pretty good at what it does, however there is a price to be paid for speed. System 1 loves to simplify. System 2 is the conscious being that we call I. But System 1 you is just as much you as System 2 you. Daniel Kahneman compares System 2 to a supporting character who believes herself to be the lead actor and often has little or no idea of what's going on. Now that we have a foundational understanding of how our brains work, we can start thinking of how to develop a negative campaign. In this next ad, listen to what is said, but most importantly, listen to the audio characteristics. What is being communicated? We can steer ourselves out of this crisis. crisis. Then who's going to charge the economy? We need a rescue plan for the middle class. We need to provide relief for homeowners. It's going to take a new direction. If we keep talking about the economy, we're going to lose. lose, lose. I'm going to do something to government. I call it the smaller, simpler, smarter approach to government. Getting rid of programs, turning programs back to states, and finally making government itself more efficient. I'm going to get rid of Obamacare. It's killing jobs, and it's keeping our kids from having the bright prospects they deserve. We have a moral responsibility not to spend more than we take in. I'll make sure that America is a job-creating machine like it has been in the past. It's high time to bring those principles of fiscal responsibility to Washington, D.C. I'm Mitt Romney, and I approve this message. You don't attack just for the sake of attacking. You attack with a plan and with discipline to show your strengths via your opponent's weaknesses. When voters dislike a candidate, they are more motivated to go out and vote to keep that lying, cheating reprobate out of office. Negative ads that work aren't negative, according to Republican strategist Alex Castellanos. They are hard-hitting issue ads about our opponent's record of shame. In short, when a candidate warns you not to touch the hot stove, he's not being negative. He's protecting you from harm. Sadly for conservatives, when two evenly matched forces go head to head outside of a fairy tale, the side that tries to play nice usually ends up with its head in a box. In Canada, during the 2004 parliamentary election campaign, Stephen Harper had an edict. No negative campaigning. The Liberals leaned heavily on attacks that accused Conservative leader Stephen Harper and his party of harboring a hidden agenda of right-wing social policies. The Conservatives lost. The lesson learned? Even in gentle and nice Canada, it doesn't pay to be a Boy Scout in an election campaign. Determining the proper ratio of positive to negative is a bit of an art depending on the issues and mood of the people. The positive aspects of building brand equity are more difficult and are done over a longer period of time. Brand equity should be built and the public educated before the campaign starts. You need to build your brand to withstand any negative attacks that you might face. A negative campaign accomplishes its goals a lot faster and therefore can start a lot later. A negative campaign causes people to suspend their logical doubts and concerns about your plan because their emotions about the alternative have taken over. Fundamentally, it is a stress response, and stress turns off our ability to reason effectively. Do your preparation and research on your opponent well before the election campaign starts. Remember, you have a story to tell. The story has many chapters. Write the story before the campaign starts. During the election warm-up show, you will start to precondition reporters to your main themes and you will start to educate and inform the voters. Remember the words of Paul Bear Bryant. It's not the will to win that matters. Everyone has that. It's the will to prepare to win that matters. Your negative campaign must be based on facts. Research your opponent and document everything that you plan to use. Know their strengths and weaknesses. Know the strengths and weaknesses of their policies in relation to what is happening in the nation. Know your own strengths and weaknesses. When you attack during the campaign, you must be swift, both on the attack and on the counterattack. During the campaign, you will not have time to do this research. 
How early do you start? Timing is important. The objective of every campaign manager is to be the aggressor, to go on the offensive. You do not want to be on the defensive, backpedaling and explaining why you are losing. The one, the one on the offensive is setting the context and telling the story. You want to force your opponent to talk about what you want to talk about. You want to try to distract the opponent and throw them off their game. But how early do you start? Obviously, you start before the official campaign starts, and hopefully before your opponent starts. But the earlier you start, the greater the risk of running out of steam or running out of limited resources. Starting too early, you might also have people start to lose interest. You need to plan your advertising strategy in a way to keep voters interested for the duration of the campaign. This graphic shows how advertising was distributed in the 2008 U.S. presidential race. We can see that advertising ramps up the closer we get to election day, but there's also variability with little breaks in advertising to prevent overload. You can see the strategy differences between the Democrats and the Republicans. The Democrats started a little bit earlier, built up, created opinions, and then in the last week eased off a bit and ran a reminder campaign while the Republicans started later, pushed harder and longer. Once you have the overall advertising plan, then you need to divide it between negative and positive. The closer the race, the more negative advertising there will be. How much of your advertising budget will you allocate to negative ads? How will you time the negative ads? Here are three possible scenarios. Do you want to be more negative at the start and then more positive near the end? Or do you want to be more positive at the start and negative at the end? How will you allocate resources between fear and anger? How do you want to time the fear and anger? This can get very complicated. Your negative campaign is not just about the voters. It affects the media and most importantly, your opponent. You want to put your opponent on the defensive throw your opponent off his game. When the opponent is forced to react, he can't tell his story. You also want to create a media feeding frenzy. The media loves a good fight and will instinctively do its part. If your comparative or attack ads have something interesting or something shocking, they will start to dig and start talking about the issue. Earned media via news coverage and bloggers is worth far more than advertising time because these people can go deeper into the subject than can your 30-second ads. And they're free. Your ads are the spark, and the media can be turned into the fire. And, of course, influence the voters. Your 30-second commercials running again and again and again, pounding an idea into their conscious memory, and then even further and more effectively into their subconscious, where their core beliefs reside. Arm's length or anonymous third parties can carry out the more risky aspects of your negative campaign. They can fan the flames while minimizing potential for backlash against you. Develop and use third parties, such as bloggers or support organizations, to carry out the bulk of the dirty work, while you use safe, comparative ads that create an image of strength and respectability. But, you can't make the campaign about something people don't want the campaign to be about. That is why you have to understand what the people want. Once again, our objective is to get the most votes. You do this by influencing your supporters to vote and influencing your opponent's voters not to vote. By now it should be clear that there's a lot going on psychologically in political ads as they communicate with the reptilian brain to generate fear and with the limbic system to create anger directed at the other candidate. Political campaigns can tailor negative ads using fear and anger to achieve specific goals. Make your base feel angry and make your opponent's base feel afraid or anxious. If you want to make sure that your supporters get out and vote, create anger. Influence the fight instinct. The angry citizen is motivated but relatively ignorant. Anger does little to change our minds. Instead, it mobilizes voters to fight for their convictions. Remember that anger is elicited in response to threats to one's goals and perceptions of unfairness. Successful campaign ads arouse anger by suggesting that people have been or will be unfairly hurt and then cast blame. 
When we are angry, we are not very receptive to points of view that are not our own. In the political space, this reinforces our tendency to stay closely aligned with our party, partisanship, and other political habits. If you want to influence people to change their minds, or sway uncommitted voters, create fear. Scare voters into paying attention. Generate fear about what the other candidate might do to ruin the nation's future. Fear and anxiety prompt people to seek more information, look at both sides of the story, and rethink their course of action. It unlocks the grip that habit holds over people's decisions. Voters who feel anxious are more likely to defect from their political loyalties than are those who do not feel anxious. Typically, conservatives will try to create fear about the economy, while progressives will try to create fear on social issues. If you're not sure which way the undecided independent voters will swing, then work to suppress their interest in the election. Bombardment of fear and anger from both sides creates confusion and causes the undecided to not participate. Creating stress in decision-making requires that all parties play their part. With the middle suppressed, your get-out-to-vote campaign becomes more important. If you know that you're comfortably in the lead, then create optimism and happiness. Feel-good ads are mobilizing. Ads that stir up positive emotions such as hope, pride, and enthusiasm stimulate voters' interests and participation in an election. But, like anger, positive ads polarize the electorate and make people act without thinking by activating the habits and partisanship of supporters and opponents. An interesting development is the evolution of the 30-second ad into Obama's 30-minute infomercial in 2008, and then into the 2012 full-blown anti-Obama documentary shown in theaters, Obama's America 2016. This documentary probably did not change many minds, but it did further polarize the voter base. This type of politicking is yet another indicator of what is happening to American politics. More often than not, trying to pin down candidates for their backgrounds more than their policies, a focus on personalities more than issues, and a play to anger and fear rather to thoughtfulness and judgment. A word of warning. Negative campaigns, especially personal attacks, can backfire. Make sure that you test the campaign before you take it to the public. The following set of slides highlight some of the lessons we've learned about negative campaigning. Attack your opponent where you are strongest. Make your opponent a part of your story. Make the attacks about the public record and real issues. Provide information about what the costs of their policies will be, both their past and future policies. Discuss their qualifications. Are they experienced? Have they been in office before? Do they have the required traits? Are they strong? Do they make things happen? Do they flip-flop? And most importantly, are they out of touch with their constituents? And remember, everything that you do builds or destroys your brand equity. So, be fair. Make sure that you throw clean mud. Factual and well-documented mud. Be nice. Say something positive about your opponent and then disagree on the main issue. Make it about substantive arguments. Timing is very important. Negative political ads are most effective when shown in moderation. Extremely frequent exposure to a negative ad has a backlash effect on the sponsoring candidate. Ads that are repeated with intervals of time between them are more effective. People will be more likely to appreciate and vote for the candidate who is sponsoring the negative advertisement if the ad is presented in a spaced out manner over time. And remember, graphic and audio design can be more important than the words themselves as they convey more emotional content and have the power to create anxiety. According to what people say, a negative ad can be positive if it is more about issues than about attacks on the personal traits of the opponent. The most interesting issues are those that are related to the responsibilities of governing. Be specific, not vague. Make it easy for people to understand 
what you are claiming. If you want credibility, then be able to prove what you say through documentation. In The Art of War, Sun Tzu said, If you know your enemies and know yourself, you will not be imperiled in a hundred battles. If you do not know your enemies, but you do know yourself, you will win one and lose one. If you do not know your enemies, nor yourself, you will be imperiled in every single battle. So let's look at what we've learned about ourselves and our opponents through strategies in the past. On the conservative side in the US, we can learn from the Rovian playbook. These are the strategies and philosophies of Karl Rove, who is credited with the 1994 and 1998 Texas gubernatorial victories of George W. Bush, as well as Bush's 2000 and 2004 presidential campaigns. The left uses the playbook Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. Written in 1971, the left still uses the fundamentals of Alinsky's rules in their campaign strategies. Let's be realistic. If you have a plan for attacking your opponent, be certain that your opponent has a plan to attack you. Don't even wonder. He does. Now, what would you do if you were attacked like this? Meet Hollywood Mark Murphy. He just moved back to Staten Island after living in California for 18 years. Some say he moved back to run for Congress. Others say he left because the failed actor didn't pay his taxes. Mark Murphy is so desperate, he'll say anything, even shamelessly smearing Michael Grimm, a decorated combat veteran and former FBI agent. Hollywood Mark Murphy, a desperate candidate, will do desperate things. I'm Michael Grimm, and I approve this message. The speed and effectiveness with which you respond adds to your credibility and your brand equity. Identify your competitive disadvantages and work to minimize them. Do scenario analysis, that is, come up with ideas about how your opponent will attack you and prepare responses beforehand. Prepare for as many types of attacks as possible. During the campaign, have a team available to focus just on responses to attacks so that the rest of your team does not get dragged into the trench warfare. During the campaign, you're going to be trying to pull your opponent off of his story and into yours. Conversely, your opponent will be trying to pull you off of your story and into his. But don't fall for it. Staying on message is much more important. When attacked, craft your counterattacks in such a way that they add to your story. If you're called a witch, ignore it. If the charge is stupid, small, little publicized, sometimes it'll go away. If your core story, if your strength is attacked, then a strong rebuttal, preferably with a little bit of anger, and with evidence, is expected. But always try to take the moral high ground. The following are a few traditional strategies for dealing with a negative attack. If the attack is true, admit it. Admit it before the attack even comes. Admit the indiscretion and ask for forgiveness. Admit it and re-spin and turn the attack into a positive. Or alternatively, deflect it, deflecting it with sorrow or with humor. But be careful, humor in politics is risky. If the story is false, Deny the charge, deny it and demand proof, or deny it and demand an apology. Stonewalling, by saying that there is no story, delaying or blocking by refusing to answer questions, or by giving evasive replies, rarely works in politics. Attack the attack. Criticizing your opponent for negative campaigning, while it might be hypocritical, is always effective but you need to be the first one to use it effectively. How would you defend yourself from the following attack? Congressman Michael Grimm said he would get things done in Washington. But what have we seen? Shut down. Shut down. Government shut down. Congress. Nothing done in Congress. Can't get anything done. And while the Senate passed bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform months ago, there's still no vote by Grimm and the House Republicans to fix our broken immigration system. We elected Grimm to do a job, and he's not. Call Congressman Grimm. Tell them the time for talk is over. It's time to vote on immigration reform. SEIU Cope is responsible for the content of this advertising. 
Most attack ads are based on some sort of logical fallacy used to exaggerate the little bit of truth that the ad is based on. By knowing what sort of logical fallacy was used in the attack ad against you, you can best position your response. Having someone with a good logic and debating background on your crisis management team is always a benefit. The worst thing, after crime and corruption, is to develop either through your own negligence or through effective messaging by your opponent, is to be seen as being out of touch with the real needs of the common person, the working class. It's an insinuation of elitism, that you don't know what the common person must suffer through to survive. Your goal is to be in values alignment with the people, to understand their needs and the aspirations of the people in order to best represent them. How do you stay in touch? Well, if you truly want to do something rather than to just be someone, then it's easy. After all this talk about negative campaigns, let me remind you that not all is negative. While you can and might need to go negative, you definitely do not need to go ugly, as ugly ads can backfire and hurt your character. Positive emotions, such as enthusiasm and hope, also play a significant role in many campaigns and can have powerful effects on voters as well. Think back to Ronald Reagan's 1984 Morning in America advertising campaign, which is a great example. Reagan's ads engendered positive emotions by employing uplifting music, accompanied by images of American flags, weddings, and happy families moving into new homes. Barack Obama's 2008 campaign also generated significant positive emotions, which led 61% of Democrats surveyed by Gallup in the summer of 2008 to report that they were more enthusiastic about voting than usual. This concludes this introduction to negative advertising in election campaigns. The following is a three-minute report on the use of negative ads in an American senatorial election race. It's been a while since we've been able to turn on the TV and not see a nasty political commercial. We asked the Republican U.S. Senate candidates if they stood behind the latest set of ads. Millions of dollars spent and plenty of mudslinging. Good evening, I'm Eric Franke. And I'm Sarah Carlson. First tonight at 10, the final issue in our series on the U.S. Senate race, and it's one lots of people have been talking about. Businessman Eric Hovde, former Governor Tommy Thompson, former Congressman Mark Newman, and Assembly Speaker Jeff Fitzgerald face off in next Tuesday's Republican primary. The night team's Theo Keith asked them why this race has gotten so nasty. But he pushed for nine different tax hikes. There have been attacks of every kind. And Hufty refused to pay his property taxes until he was taken to court. Even some actual mud being slung. Newman hopes he'll forget his four votes to raise the national debt. As News 3 has found, all of the ads are half-truths at best. Even in their interviews with us, the candidates continued the attacks. Well, I think the comparison of policy issues is something that is legitimate. So putting Eric Hubby on, on TV saying I'm okay with higher taxes, for example, that, I mean, that's okay. That's a comparison of policy. We've also found that needs clarification. Hubby has come out in favor of broad tax cuts. He does support eliminating tax breaks for big businesses and the wealthy. And Tommy Thompson is desperate to hide his support for Obamacare. Hubby has gone negative himself. I'm not going to just sit here and be a complete punching bag uh, and allow everybody to hit on me and not do some type of response, but at least when I tried to make a response, I tried to do it with a little levity. So who threw the first punch? Hovde, Newman, and Thompson are claiming self-defense. If you are going to besmirch my character and you're going to attack my credibility and my legacy, I'm going to have to defend myself. That only then did I get into it and put up any kind of response. There has been one voice who hasn't been attacking, partly because of a lack of campaign funds and partly because he says the public is tired of the negativity. Jeff Fitzgerald has been focusing on his record. Well, I just think we're not focused on the right thing. I, I think we should be focused on uh, Tammy Baldwin, who's going to be the Democratic nominee. And, uh, you know, to me, I think that's what the race is about, and I think it's going to be a clear-cut choice. And we couldn't help but notice, in the past couple days, it's almost like the others were listening. Unfortunately, this campaign has turned ugly. You can say that again. Many of the ads now on the air highlight personal achievements instead of attacking the other guys. But conservatives rally. We cut spending and balanced the budget. Together, we transformed Wisconsin and sparked the conservative movement.
And Thompson led the latest poll released yesterday, but still one in every five voters is undecided, partly uh, for the reason we did these five stories. The winner of Tuesday's primary will face Democrat Tammy Baldwin in November. If you've missed any of our five-part series, you can find the stories in the politics section of channel3000.com. You can also go through the candidates' claims there as well. Certainly interesting to hear their take mm -hmm. on all those ads we've been watching. Thank you, Theo.